manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Thank you, Father. Praise you, Father. We rejoice that we are found in you not having our own righteousness, but the righteousness which is of Christ by faith. Thank you, Lord. And thank you that this morning, Lord, we acknowledge, we acknowledge that we are complete in your righteousness. We stand in your righteousness alone. And we rejoice that we have access into the deep things of God by the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord. And I pray for everybody that is connected to this broadcast all over the world this morning that revealed knowledge is granted everyone connected. I declare that veils full of clarity comes by the Holy Spirit. We speak words which the Holy Ghost teacheth. We speak words which the Holy Ghost speaketh. With the Holy Ghost teacher comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Thank you, Lord, that your people are built up and equipped and edified and Jesus is glorified as we go through the pages of your word by the inspiration of the Holy Ghost and by the breath of God. And I decree that by the end of this service, we'll all be the better for it. In Jesus' precious name, and every believer says a powerful amen. Praise God. Lift your right hands to heaven. Let's release our faith together as we say these words. I am born of God. I am born of the word. The word of God is my nature. I do not struggle to do the word. I do the word naturally. Therefore today, I will understand the word of his grace. I will be built up. By the end of this service, I will never be the same. Never ever be the same again. In Jesus' name. And every believer says that, amen, like thunder. Praise the Lord, hallelujah. Well, we want to welcome every one of you connected to this service by way of Kingdom Life Network, Facebook, YouTube, and all our campuses and house centers around the city and around the world. It's a joy to keep teaching and learning and equipping you with the word of his grace because that's all we've got at this time to study and study and study that you become a workman that needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. I want to encourage every one of you to grab a friend, grab a family member, share the broadcast on your pages, please. Use your page for evangelism today. Share the broadcast on your page. Invite people, tag people, get people on. You know, wherever you're watching around the world, if you're watching on television, share, get family members to come in. Let's study the world together. Glory to God. All right. We've been looking at the misunderstood God, the misunderstood God in the past few days, and it's been exciting just studying the world. This morning, we're going to proceed from where we stopped yesterday. The book of James, chapter 1, verse 13. James, chapter 1, from verse number 13. Let no man say, when he's tempted, I'm tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil. Neither tempted he any man. Verse 14. But every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust and enticed. 15. Then when lust had conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. 16. He says, do not err, my beloved brethren. 17. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of light. With whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. I like the next verse. Of his own will begat he us with the word of truth. That we should be a kind of first fruits of his creature. Give me 19 and 20. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. Next verse. For the wrath of man walketh not the righteousness of God. So in the past few days, we've been looking at the fact that God's character does not have anything that has to do with wrath. And we're trying to establish, looking at the scriptures very carefully, taking care of all the presumptions from Eden. All the presumptions from Eden right into Cain and Abel and right through the pages of the scripture to establish where the presumptions came from. We saw Job and we looked at a number of characters. We saw Sodom and Gomorrah. We saw the world of Noah and we've, ju we've just been on it. Yesterday we began to look at the sacrifices and the offerings and we established quite a number of things. If you are not here, please get the materials. They will be a great source of, of equipping for you against the days to come. 
The book of Genesis chapter 15 verse 6. Let's get back to Abraham. Genesis chapter 15 verse number 6. And he believed in the Lord and he counted it to him for righteousness. He believed in the Lord and he counted it to him for righteousness. Give me Galatians chapter 3 verse 8. Galatians chapter 3 verse number 8. And the scripture foreseeing that God will justify the hidden through faith. Preach before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, Indeed shall all nations be blessed. That's the gospel to Abraham. Indeed shall all nations be blessed. So we began to say that all of God's utterances in scriptures were good news. Anything that is not good news is not an utterance from God. He says, Indeed shall all families of the earth be blessed. Now yesterday we established that what Abraham was asking for when he was praying for Sodom, he said to God, if you find ten righteous men in the city, will you destroy the city? And we said that the definition of righteousness there was not morality. He wasn't asking for if you find ten moral men because he himself was not, a, was not that a good guy. He had had all of his issues going on. So righteous men there will be defined by believing the gospel without works. It will be righteousness without works. That's why Jesus talked about Sodom. And when he was talking about the city of Sodom, he said Sodom refused God's messengers. He ref Sodom refused God's carriers of good news. So again, did Abraham discover righteousness by moral conduct? Of course, the answer is no. So Abraham knew that when he was asking God for righteous people in Sodom, he was asking about people that will believe the gospel without works. So the real issue all through the ages is faith in the gospel or faith in the finished work of Christ. That has been the real issue with the gospel or faith in the ability of God or faith in God's character which is consistent. Now look at Genesis. Let's get into the real deal today. Genesis chapter 22 verse number 2. Genesis chapter 22 verse number 2. And he said, take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a bond offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell you of. So now, Moses, in writing the story of Abraham and the encounter of Abraham, explained it as a puzzle. You know, he used chida in his writing from the things I've taught you in the time past. He used puzzles because of his style of teaching ministry. Again, remember that the teaching ministry of Moses was to a people that were hardened, a people whose hearts were hardened. He called them children in whom there is no faith. And so that informed his style of communication with the children of Israel. He used puzzles or riddles in communicating. All right, so within the riddles were the truths of God's word hidden. So you will see puzzles or riddles and within the riddles, you will see the truth of God's word hidden in the riddles. So now let's begin the journey together with Abraham. Look at that Genesis chapter 22 verse number 5. Genesis chapter 22 verse number 5. And Abraham said unto his young men, Abide ye here with the ass, and I and the Lord will go yonder and worship. Look at it, look at it. And come again to you. So Abraham knew that he was not going to go and kill Isaac because even Abraham and the young men that were with him knew that Abraham and Isaac will come back to them. We will come back to you. So now, let's see correct offering. Let's see the real deal from this situation with Abraham. Look at that Genesis 22 verse number 4, 14. Genesis 22 verse number 14. Genesis 22 verse number 14. And Abraham called the name of that place Jehovah Jireh. As it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord it shall be seen. If your Bible is mine, I will underline, it shall be seen. In the mount of the Lord it shall be seen. You know, sometimes you can mix revelation in history, just like puzzles or history. And in that puzzle or history is revelation knowledge. All right. So in this history of Abraham, there is revelation knowledge. And that's what we're heading to right now. But there is truth hidden in the history. Remember Hebrews chapter 11 verse 1. Now faith is a substance of things hoped for, 
the evidence of things not seen. The evidence of things not seen. All right. So you won't see, you won't see the revelation just by looking at the situation. The revelation will have to be discerned by the Holy Spirit or by the New Testament. All right. So in Hebrews chapter chapter 22 verse 14, the word gyre means to see in the Hebrew language. The word gyre means to see. And you will see the application of that word gyre in several scriptures used by Moses, by the same Moses. Look at Genesis chapter 1 verse 4. Genesis chapter 1 verse 4. And God saw the light and God gyre the light. God saw the light that it was good and God divided the light from the darkness. So Genesis 1 4, he used the word gyre. God gyre the light. Look at Genesis chapter 1 verse 10. Genesis chapter 1 verse number 10. And God called the, earth dry, the dry land earth. And the gathering together of the waters called the seas. And God gyre that it was good. God saw, God gyre that it was good. Look at Genesis chapter 1 verse 12. Genesis chapter 1 verse number 12. And the earth brought forth grass and herb yielding seed after his kind. And the tree yielding fruit, whose seed was in itself after his kind. And God gyre, God saw that it was good. And again, the use of the word gyre by Moses in his writings. Look at Genesis chapter 1 verse 18. Genesis chapter 1 verse 18. And to rule over the day and over the night. And to divide the light from the darkness. And God gyre or God saw that it was good. Look at Genesis chapter 1 verse 21. Genesis 1 21. Moses is using the word gyre. He says, and God gyre that it was good. Look at Genesis 1 25. Genesis 1 25. And God gyre that it was good. Look at Genesis 1 31. Genesis chapter 1 verse number 31. And God gyre everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. We're dealing with Jehovah Jire. Jehovah sees, God saw. Genesis chapter 2, verse 19. Same application of Jire. Genesis chapter 2, verse 19. And out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air, and brought them unto Adam to see what he will call them, and whatsoever. Adam called every living creature that was the name thereof. Whatever Adam called them was their name. For Adam to see. He brought them for Adam to see. For Adam to gyre. Look at Genesis 3 verse 6. Genesis chapter 3 verse number 6. And when the woman gyre that the tree was good. When the woman saw that the tree was good. So in the creation who was seen who was seen in the creation? Of course, it was Moses. Alright? It was Moses. It was not God that was seen. It was Moses that was seen. Who saw what God will do in the case of Abraham? Who saw what God will do in Genesis 22? Of course, it was Abraham who saw. Okay? So, Abraham saw what God will do. How do we know that? John chapter 8 verse 56. John chapter 8 verse 56. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day. And he saw it and was glad. He saw it and was glad. Abraham saw. So who saw in Genesis chapter 1 and 2 account? Was it God that saw or it was Abraham that saw? Of course, it was Abraham. I mean, it was Moses who saw in the account of Genesis chapter 1 verse number 2. Now, so who saw in Genesis chapter 3? It was Eve that saw in Genesis chapter 3. Okay, who saw on Mount Moriah? Was it God or Abraham? It was Abraham that saw on Mount Moriah. Abraham saw. So, it was Moses that saw. Abraham saw. Eve saw. Alright? It is them that saw what God will do. So, that's why he called the place Jireh. 
That's why Abraham called that place Jehovah Jireh. It shall be seen. Jehovah shall be seen. What he saw was it on the scene. What Abraham was seeing was it on that scene that he called Jehovah Jireh. No, it can't be on that scene. Because faith, Abraham by faith. Faith is a substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. The evidence of things not seen. Please stay with me. This is going to be very exciting. All right, now. So someone saw God's provision. Who saw God's provision? Of course, Abraham. Look at it in Genesis chapter 22 verse 7. Genesis chapter 22 verse 7. And Isaac spake unto Abraham his father and said, My father, and he said, Here am I, my son. And he said, Behold the fire and the wood. But where is the lamb for a bond offering? Look at the next verse, verse 8. And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. God will provide. The word provide is the word Elohim. Hebrew says he will provide to himself. He will provide to himself. So where does this leave all the prior offerings and sacrifices? If God was the one that was going to provide to himself, then what was the use of all the offerings and the burnt offerings and all the sacrifices and all the animals that they were offering in the Old Testament from all the things we saw in the course of teaching yesterday? So now Abraham had a revelation that the offerer was God. That the offerer was God. So it was works, 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 works. All those offerings they were bringing were just works. Because we thought we were the ones guilty. So we should naturally be the ones to be paying. So when they were bringing the animals, in their mind, they are paying for their sin. In their mind, they were appeasing the anger of God, which is another major presumption. And we felt God was the one we were owing. So we are, God is angry with us. God is, we have to appease God with our offerings. We have to appease God with confessing our sins. We have to appease God by pummeling ourselves. As if God is some terrorist that wants to go about trying to ensure that everybody pays for the evil he has done. And that is another aspect of presumption. Now stay with me. So in explaining the gospel... We, we feel that you are the one guilty. Of course, you are the one guilty. But you are not the one to offer. You are the one guilty, but you are not the one to offer. And we will see shortly that you are not the one to take the offering. And this is why it is difficult to see that God has never changed. It is difficult to see because God's character is colored by our guilt, our perception, you know, and, um, you know, human beings, we believe that when people do wrong, they should suffer for it. So that perception, we have used it to look at God like the one who will not let you go free if you do something wrong. He will get you to pay for it and pay for it daily. So that perception is difficult to make people see that God has never changed. It's the same yesterday, the same today, the same forever. Sometimes you will even hear people say, well, you know, the God of the Old Testament is more powerful than the God of the New Testament. All of that comes from this coloration and assumptions concerning God. And you know, this assumption started from Eve, right in Eden. It started from Eve and we took time to see all of Eve's assumptions. How can you be that presumptuous? At least Eve had no pastor to mislead her. Eve did not have books that will mislead her. You know, Eve was directly interacting with God and yet look at how she assumed things. Now, so who will provide an offering? God will provide an offering on your behalf. Now look at it. Paul said that sin was in the world 
But sin is not imputed when there is no law. Paul also said that sin was in the world and death reigned by sin. Death reigned by sin. Even though that death was not visible. Sin was in the world and death reigned by sin. Even though people could not see that it was death reigning and ruling, they couldn't see that it was the dominion of death which came by sin. So they assumed that all the death was, was God in operation to get people for the wrongs that people are continually doing. Look at Hebrews chapter 11 verse 8. Let's look at Abraham very carefully today. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 8. By faith... Remember again the, the, what, what we apply here. By the, by the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed. And he went out, not knowing whither he went. If you observe, the story of Abraham in Hebrews chapter 11 started from verse 8 to 19. From verse 8 to to 19. About 11 verses dedicated to Abraham alone. And if you pay attention carefully looking at the Old Testament with the eyes of the New Testament in the book of Hebrews when he was talking about Abraham, he didn't mention the offerings, he didn't mention the altar, he didn't mention the incense, he didn't mention all the things that Abraham did. There was no mention of it in the book of Hebrews at all. Look at it. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 8. He was called in verse 8. By faith Abraham when he was called. Look at verse 9. Verse 9. By faith he sojourned in the land of promise. He sojourned in the land of promise. So number 1 he was called. Number 2 he was holding on to the promise. Verse 10. Verse 10. He looked for a city which had foundations, who builder and maker was God. So verse 8, he was called. Verse 9, he held on to the promise. Verse 10, he was still looking for a city. Verse 11, verse 11. Through faith, he, she judged him faithful who had promised. She judged him faithful who had promised. Verse 12, verse 12. Therefore, there sprang there even of one and him as good as dead. So many as the stars of the sky in multitude. And as the sand which is by the seashore innumerable. God still spoke to Abraham in verse 12. Then verse 13. Verse 13. These all died in faith. Verse 14. Verse 14. For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. So verse 14, country. Verse 15. Verse 15, country. Mindful of that country. Verse 16. Verse 16. But now they desire a better country. Then look at verse 17. Verse 17. By faith Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac. And he that had received the promises, offered up his only begotten son. <clears throat> By faith Abraham, when he was tried. When he was tried. Question. Who tried him? Was it God that tried him? No. It can be God. Okay. Now hold on. For clarity. Who offered up his only begotten son? Who offered up his only begotten son? Was it Abraham? Well, remember, Abraham didn't have an only begotten son. Abraham had sons. There was Ishmael and there was Isaac. So who offered up his only begotten son? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. So it was God who offered up his only begotten son. So who did he receive? Who did Abraham receive? Go back to that verse 17 of, of Hebrews 11 again. By faith, Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac. And he that had received the promises, offered up his only begotten son. 
Next verse. Of whom it was said that in Isaac shall thy seed be called. In Isaac shall thy seed be called. So the question is, who did Abraham receive? The Bible says he received Christ in a figure. He received Christ in a figure. So who offered the only begotten? God in a figure. God in a figure. Look at verse 18 again. Verse 18 again. Of whom it was said that in Isaac, not Isaac, in Isaac, Shall thy seed be called in Isaac, not Isaac, pay attention, in Isaac shall thy seed be called. The word Kaleo, K-A-L-E-O, Kaleo, that means Isaac was not the seed. Isaac was not the seed. Look at verse 19, verse 19. Accounting that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from whence also he received him in a figure. He received him in a comparison. He received him in a comparison. Who did he receive? He received Jesus in a figure of speech. He received Jesus in a comparison. The word accounting, look at me, the word accounting is the Greek word logizomai. Logizomai. Accounting that God was able to raise him from the dead. That is, he reasoned, he took note of the fact, logizomai. He took note of the fact that God was able to raise from the dead. He took note of the fact that God was able to raise from the dead. So what did he do? He received him in a comparison or in a figure. He received Christ in a figure or in comparison. The writer of Hebrew uses the word komizo. K-O-M-I-Z-O. That word he used in verse 39. Received. Komizo. He used the same word in Hebrews 11.39. Look at a play of words here. And this all, having obtained a good report through faith, receive not the promise. Comizo. Comizo. So look at the play of words. Received not the promise. But rather, received him in a figure. Look at me everybody. Received not the promise. But rather... Received him in a figure. It's a play of words. Receive not agabadagam. Receive not the promise, but rather received him in a comparison. That's the play of words there. Now, look at a very vital thing. So Moriah, Mount Moriah, where Abraham went, was a parable. It was a parable. That's why Jesus said he rejoiced to see my day. And in the day of Jesus, in the day of Jesus, who is offering? Who is offering in the day of Jesus? Of course, it is Jesus. Did we offer Jesus? No. What did we do? We received Jesus as the offer. We received Jesus as the offer. We were not the ones that offered. So in the day of Jesus, Jesus is the offering and the offerer. So you can see works from Genesis chapter 4. All the sacrifices, the burning of incense, all the offerings they were offering were works, 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 works. Noah did two offerings. Abraham did many offerings because Abraham was, had a lot of wrongs. So he kept bringing offerings to cover up for all his wrongs. But he was declared righteous. He was declared righteous without works. And even after he was declared righteous without works, he was still offering animals. He was still offering animals. He was declared righteous without a single offering. Just by believing. Abraham believed and it was credited to him for righteousness. 
So God offered his only begotten in death. God offered his only begotten in death. So the question is, who received what God offered? We are the ones who are beneficiaries and recipients of God's offer. See verse 20 of Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 20. By faith Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau concerning things to come. Things that Christ will do. By the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. You see that? Isaac blessed Jacob concerning things that Christ will do. Now come with me to Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter number 4 verse 1. Romans chapter number 4 verse 1. Now please look at me for a minute before we proceed. Did God demand anyone to offer sacrifice to him in Genesis? Look at me everybody. Did God demand anyone to offer sacrifices to him in the book of Genesis? Well of course the answer is no. So now, we are still looking for the wrath of God. Don't forget, that's what is taking us all through this. We're looking at the anger, the wrath of God all through this journey. So let's get back to Romans chapter 4 verse 1. Follow the reading carefully. We're going to read from verse 1 to 6. What shall we say then? That Abraham, our father, as pertaining to the flesh, had found. Verse 2. For if Abraham were justified by works, he had whereof to glory, but not before God. For what say of the scripture? Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now to him that walketh is the reward not reckoned of grace but of debt. But to him that walketh not but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly his faith is counted for righteousness. Even as David also described the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputed righteousness without works. Give me verse 7. Saying, blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. 8. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. So Abraham believing in the offering or believing in God's offering. Abraham did not believe in what he was doing. Abraham had faith in what God will do. But even though he had faith in what God will do, he was still giving offerings. So Abraham didn't believe in what he was doing. He believed in what God will do. That is what Abraham found. Look at Galatians chapter 3 verse 8. Galatians chapter 3 verse number 8. And the scripture foreseeing that God will justify the hidden through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham saying, in these shall all nations be blessed. The writer of Hebrews said that the gospel was preached unto them as well as unto us. The gospel was preached unto them as well as unto us. God preached before the gospel to Abraham saying, Now, stay with me. Galatians chapter 3 verse 9. Galatians chapter 3 verse 9. So then, they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. Verse 10. Galatians 3.10 for, for as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. 11. But that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God, it is evident, for the just shall live by faith. It's not the just shall live their lifestyle by faith. What it's simply saying is that the just shall come into righteousness by faith. 
the just shall come into righteousness by faith. Give me verse 13 of the same Galatians 3. 13. Christ hath redeemed us from the cause of the law. Being made a cause for us, for it is written, Cause is everyone that hangeth on a tree. Verse 14. That the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ. That we might receive the promise of the spirit through faith. Actually the original is that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. 15. Brethren, I speak after the manner of men. Though it be but a man's covenant, yet if it be confirmed, no man disannul it or added thereto. 16. Now pay attention to 16. Now, to Abraham and his seed where the promise is made, he saith not unto seeds as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed which is Christ. To thy seed which is Christ. Give me verse 22 of the same chapter. Galatians 3.22 now. But the scripture said, circle that verse because we will get there in a bit. But the scripture had concluded all under sin. But the scripture had concluded all under sin. That the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. All under sin. So that means the captivity of man was found in sin. The captivity of man was found in sin. Look at it now. Had concluded all under sin. Now look at me everybody. That means that the captivity of man was found with sin. Question. Was God the captor? Of course no. So why were they offering to God? Why? Why were they bringing offerings to God? It was a misguided information. One of those presumptions again. Now, look at Matthew 26, 28. Matthew 26, 28. For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Underline that word, for the remissions of of sin. For the remissions of sin. Look at Romans chapter 5 verse 12. Please pay attention carefully. Romans 5 12. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world. Not by God, not by Satan, by man. And death by sin. And so, death passed upon all men. For that all have sinned. Look at verse 13. For until the law, sin was in the world. But sin is not imputed when there is no law. Verse 14. Nevertheless, death, death reign, the word basilia, death reign or the kingdom of death was from Adam to Moses. The kingdom of death was from Adam to Moses. Even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression. Who is the figure of him that was to come. So again question. What reigned from Adam to Moses? What reigned from Adam to Moses? Death. Alright. Write that somewhere. Death. Okay. Romans chapter 6 verse 23. Romans chapter 6 verse 23. For the wages of sin is death. Not the wages of God. The wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The wages of sin. So we said yesterday that the wages of sin is the requirement. The word wages is the word requirement. So the question is, who required death? Was it God that required death? No. Who required death? 
sin. Sin required death. And God is not sin. So how come they were offering the sacrifices to God? How come they were offering sacrifices to God? So again, they were painting God as the captor. They were painting God as the one that was behind all the evils. So they were offering to God to appease him. Another presumption in the Old Testament. Now, Sin was in the world, but sin was not imputed. But there was sin consciousness. Look at it in Romans chapter 2 verse 14 where we read the other day. Romans chapter 2 verse 14 and 15. For when the Gentiles which have no law do by nature the things contained in the law, this, having not the law, are a law unto themselves. Look at the next verse which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness that their thoughts, the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another. That is those who sin without the law, perish without the law, for their hearts accuse them. Their hearts is called sin consciousness. So, there was sin consciousness even before the law came. Their hearts were accusing them and when their hearts accused them, they took animal and offered to God because in their presumptuous state, the accusation of their heart was God coming after them. In their presumptuous state. That's why people keep confessing sins to God today because in their presumptuous state, their problem is with God. Their problem is with God. In their presumptuous state, God is the one that is punishing them in their presumptuous state. So sin consciousness became the big deal all through the ages. But the question is, who is offering Christ? Who is giving Christ as an offering? Remember, God was in Christ reconciling the world. God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. So who is offering Christ? It is Christ himself offering himself on man's behalf. Look at John 1.29. John Chapter 1, verse 29. The next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. The Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Is this the Lamb that God wants, or the Lamb that God gave? Huh? Is it the lamb that God is looking for, he wants, or the lamb that God gave? It is God that gave the lamb. Man was trying to do God's work by offering animals, incense, altar. But God, God had a lamb out of his love to offer on man's behalf which automatically exonerates God from being the captor and being the one punishing sinful man. The lamb of God, the lamb that God gave to take away the sins of the world. Look at Matthew 20, 28. Please stay with me. Matthew 20, 28. Even as the son of man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. And to give his life a ransom for many. The word ransom is the Greek word Lutheran. Lutheran. Lutheran is used for the purchase of slaves. Lutheran is used for the purchase of slaves or the price paid 
to purchase slaves. So Jesus is the ransom used to purchase slaves. Jesus is the ransom used to purchase slaves. So the question is this, who is the ransom for? If Jesus is the ransom used to purchase slaves and God was in Christ, so that will mean that God is not the captor. God is not the slave owner. So that will mean that there is a slave owner who captured man and kept man in sin consciousness and instead of man appeasing that captor, man was diverted to appease God. That's why we call it the misunderstood God. Meanwhile, it was God that had the solution to release man from his captor. Please stay with me. So who is the ransom for? The ransom is for the slave owner. The slave owner. So Jesus is the price paid to purchase slaves. Remember, behold the lamb of God, not the lamb for God. Behold the lamb of God, not the lamb for God. Please that's key. Behold the lamb of God, not the lamb for God. So who will the ransom be for? Who will the ransom be for? The ransom will be for the slave owner. Question. Is God the slave owner? No. God is not and cannot be the slave owner. So who is the slave owner? Sin is the slave owner. Sin is the slave owner. So can we say that all the offerings of the book of Genesis were dead works? Yes, of course. They were dead works because first of all, they were directed to the wrong person. Secondly, they didn't have what it takes to free them from what they were doing. So it was dead works, useless works, inoperative works, unuseful works. All the offerings, all the animals they were killing, all of that confessing of sin, they were all dead works. They were dead works. A product of sin consciousness. A product of sin consciousness. Because God is not the slave owner. You know, in the Old Testament, the Old Testament has a silent impression of Satan. The Old Testament has a silent impression of Satan. And has a, you know, has a very funny concept of spiritual death. A very funny concept of spiritual death. So it was in that ignorance that these actions were taken. But thank God the veil is taken away. Glory to God. Thank God the veil is taken away. Are you still in the building? I'm enjoying myself. I'm, I'm really enjoying myself. The offering was not for God. Because God was not the slave owner. We were not under God's bondage. We were not under God's bondage. God is not the slave owner. We were not under God's bondage. God is not the slave owner. We were not under God's bondage. God, I want it to sink. God is not the slave owner. Neither was God being pacified. Neither was God being pacified. Look at Matthew 26, 28 again. Matthew 26, 28. For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. The word shed. The word shared. The word shared is liberal pouring. E-K-H-E-O. Echo. A liberal pouring. Shared. Which is shared. A liberal pouring. 
The word remission in the Greek is the word aphesis. A-P-H-E-S-I-S. Aphesis. It means a release. Aphesis is not just a pardon. Aphesis is a release. You didn't hear that. Aphesis, which is the word remission, is not just pardon. Aphesis is a release. That is, there is a release of sins. Question, who is being released? The man that the blood was shed for. The man that the blood was shed for. Who are they being released from? They are being released from the slave owner, sin. They are being released from the slave owner, sin. Come with me to John chapter 8 verse 31. Please pay attention. John chapter 8 verse 31. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him. If you continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. 32. And you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. <laughs> Look at the way they answered Jesus in 34. 34. Jesus answered them. In fact, give me 33 first. 33. John 8, 33. They answered him, We be Abraham's seed, and we are never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou, you shall be made free? 34. Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever committed sin is the servant of sin is the servant of sin. Whosoever committed sin is not the servant of God. <laughs> Whosoever committed sin is the servant of sin. The servant of sin. Alright, get back. Next verse. verse. Next verse, 35. And the servant abided not in the house forever. But the son abided ever. 36. If the son therefore, if the son therefore shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. Glory to God. We are free. We are free from the slave owner. We are free from the slavery of sin. Because the son who is the ransom for our sin, not only paid for the sin, rose and now lives in us. A guarantee that we will never be slaves to sin and we will never be bound by sin any longer. Glory to God. So whom the Son sets free is free indeed. Alright? So the believer is free indeed. The same word used for Lutheran is the same word used for Ephesus. To be free. 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 Glory to God. Free. I feel like dancing. I feel like running all over this building. Free. Glory. Whom the sun sets free is free indeed. Free from what? Romans chapter 6 verse 18. Romans chapter 6 verse 18. Being then made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. You became the servants of righteousness. Romans 6.22 Romans 6.22 But now... Be made free from sin. Be made free from sin. And become servants to God. You have your fruit unto holiness. And the end. Everlasting life. Romans chapter 8 verse 2. Please pay attention. Romans chapter 8 verse 2. For the law of the spirit of life. Verse 21. Pay attention. Romans chapter 8 verse 21. Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty 
of the children of God. Glorious liberty. Delivered from the bondage of corruption. Galatians chapter 5 verse 1. Galatians chapter 5 verse number 1. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath, 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 wherewith Christ hath made us free and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Now go back to Romans, I mean John chapter 8 verse 34. John chapter 8 verse 34. Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever committed sin is the servant of sin. The word servant is the word slave. So, if we are going to purchase a slave by a ransom, if we are going to purchase a slave by a ransom, who was the offering for? The offering of animals to God was misguided. He said it from the onset. God said it to them from the onset. In Genesis chapter 2 verse 16. Look at it. Genesis chapter 2 verse 16. And the Lord God commanded the man saying of every three of the garden thou mayest freely eat. 17. But of the three of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. He didn't say I will surely kill you. Thou shalt surely die. The day you eat of it you shall die. He didn't say the day you eat of it I will kill you. You shall die. So God put a disclaimer on himself. God put a disclaimer on himself. That is not the one responsible for this day. The day you eat of it, you shall surely die. Now, let's go to that temple again. Let's go to that temple. You know when a Pharisee goes to the temple, a Pharisee is one that is lettered in the law. He must have brought gifts and offerings. It was natural. That when a Pharisee comes to the temple, he brings gifts and offerings. But the publican, in Luke chapter 18, the publican said to God, be merciful to me. I am a sinner. Be merciful. The Pharisee came with his gift, came with his offering, came with his sacrifice, and was bragging. God, you accept my offering. I am not like the other guy. The publican came and fell before his face and said, God, be merciful to me. That word merciful to me is the Greek word elaskomai. Elaskomai. Which means, oh God, provide me an offering. Provide me an offering. And the publican went home justified. The sinner went home justified because he said, God, Provide me an offering. So the question is, who makes the provision? God himself makes the provision for the undeserving sinner. God himself. Look at Hebrews chapter 2 verse 17. Now, <clears throat> Hebrews chapter 2 verse number 17. Wherefore in all things, it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. Because the wages of sin is death, not the wages of God, the wages of sin. So God consistently put a disclaimer on requiring an offering. He stand, God stands as man's help. He will provide. Whatever sin demanded, Jireh will provide. The seed of the woman shall bruise the head. And if taught, he will come by her giving children. 
So God put a disclaimer. I, Jehovah, will provide the offering. Remember, we are still looking for that God's anger that has been misrepresented. Hebrews 10 verse 1 now. <clears throat> Hebrews 10 verse 1. For the law having a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of the things. Underline, can never. Underline, can never. Underline, can never. With those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the commas thereon to perfect. Verse 2. For then will they not have ceased to be offered because that the worshippers once purged. The worshippers once purged should have had no more conscience of sins. Come to verse 5. Verse 5. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, pay attention, sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not. Underline, thou wouldest not. Thou wouldest not. But a body has thou prepared me. He quoted that from Psalm 40, verse 6 to 8. But we'll get there in a short while. Stay with me in Hebrews 10. Look at verse 6. Hebrews 10 verse 6. Glory to God. Mm. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, thou hast had no pleasure. Please underline that. Thou hast had no pleasure. Underline that. Thou hast had no pleasure. The word pleasure is an interesting word. It's the Greek word eudokeo. E-U-D-O-K-E-O. -E pleasure. Eudokeo. E-U-D-O-K-E-O. -E what it means is I wasn't asking for it. I was not asking for sacrifices. See the use of it in Mark 1 11. Mark 1 11. And there came a voice from heaven saying, Thou art my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Pleasure. Luke 3 22. Luke 3 22. And the Holy Ghost descended in a bodily shape like a dove upon him. And a voice came from heaven which said, Thou art my beloved son, in thee I am well pleased. Thou hast had no pleasure. You the kill. I wasn't asking for it. This is the one I am asking for. This one gives me pleasure. Peter recounted that in 2 Peter 1 17. 2 Peter 1 17. For he received from God the Father honor and glory. Where there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Matthew 17 5. Matthew 17 5. Are you enjoying this at all? While he yet spake, behold a bright cloud overshadowed them. And behold a voice out of the cloud which said. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Go back to Hebrews 10 verse 2 now. Ah, Hebrews chapter 10 verse 2. For then will they not have ceased to be offered because that the worshippers once purged should have had no more conscience of sins. Look at verse 3 now carefully. But in those sacrifices, there is a remembrance again made of sins every year. 
there is a remembrance again made of sins every year. Give me verse 4. Verse 4, verse 4, verse 4, verse 4. Glory to God. For it is not possible. Underline that. For it is not possible. Underline it, underline it. In fact, circle it, circle it, circle it. Please, circle it. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. It is not possible. Psalm 40 verse 6. In fact, for time, just write it down. Psalm 40 verse 6 to 7. Micah chapter 6 verse 6 to 8. Jeremiah chapter 6 verse 20. There was a disclaimer in those verses, even though they are Old Testament, on the offering. You will find the disclaimer there. Now come with me. Let's enter other matters. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 8. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 8. Above when he said, Sacrifice and offerings and burnt offerings and offering for sin, that wouldest not, neither has pleasure therein, which are offered by the law. God is saying, I don't want that thing that the law is giving. I don't want it. Verse 9. Then said ye, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second. Question. What is the second? What is the second? Come to that Hebrews chapter 10 verse 10. The second. By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. Actually in the original it's not for all. In the original it's once for us. Once for us. Look at verse 11. And every priest standard daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. They were bringing sin consciousness by their offering of sacrifice all the time and it had no value. Verse 12. But this man, glory to God. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. Give me the next verse expecting from henceforth till his enemies be made his footstool. Verse 14. For by one offering he had perfected forever them that is sanctified. Them that is sanctified. How did he perfect us? How did Jesus perfect us? Hebrews chapter 9 verse 14. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 14. How much more shall the blood of Christ who through please pay attention who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God purge your conscience from dead works purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. To serve the living God. So when he said he offered himself to God. Actually he was saying he was to purge our conscience so we can serve God. Purge our conscience from dead works. How did he do that? Through the eternal spirit. What does that mean to us today? The indwelling of the spirit. So if you find yourself in sin consciousness. You are not walking in the spirit. If you find yourself in sin consciousness, you are not walking in the spirit because the law is called the law of sin and death. That's why Hebrews now, chapter 12, verse 28. Hebrews 12, 28. And we shall do some work there tomorrow. Wherefore, we receive in a kingdom which cannot be moved. Let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. Next verse. For our God is a consuming fire. 
Even the Bible says our God is a consuming fire. How can you say God does not use fire to destroy? Our God is a consuming fire. Well, we'll deal with that tomorrow. Look at me, everybody. But what does he consume? He consumes things of the earth. Things of the earth. Look at verse 27 of the same Hebrews 12. Hebrews 12, 27. And this word yet once more signifieth the removing of those things that are shaken as of things that are made. Things that are made. That those things which cannot be shaken may remain. Alright? So, he has consumed the whole sacrificial system. He has consumed the whole sacrificial system. No more gifts, no more offerings because he gave the best gift of all time, himself as a ransom for you. By offering his son for sins, sin has no more offering. No more offering for sin. Sin has been destroyed rendered inoperative and can no more hold the believer bound. Look at Hebrews 10, 17. You will love this. And their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. 18. Now, where the mission of this is, there is no more offering for sin. Sin does not deserve any further offering. No more confessing sin. No more trying to, 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 to satisfy sin. No. Jesus has eternally satisfied the demands of sin forever. No more. No more remission. No more offering for sin. 1 Corinthians 15, 56. 1 Corinthians 15, 56. 1 Corinthians 15, 56. The sting of death is sin. And the strength of sin is the law. So did God ask anyone to be an offering? No. He was not the one. He was not the one holding man in bondage. He was not the one holding man in bondage. So God eventually Gave the offering for man. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 18. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 18. And all things are of God. Who hath reconciled us to himself. By Jesus Christ. And had given to us the ministry of reconciliation. Next verse. To wit. That God was in Christ. Reconciling the world unto himself. Not imputing their trespasses unto them. And had committed the word unto us. The word of reconciliation. His character remains the same. His character remains the same. Over the years, man has had a progressive revelation of God. A progressive revelation of God. In that revelation, we see man in his assumptions, his mistakes, his offerings, but then we see the light of God in glimpses. Within all of these activities of man, we see the light of God in glimpses. Till finally, we see God in a person, Jesus Christ. We call him the Lamb of God. And we still call him the God who wanted the Lamb. <laughs> we still call him today the God who wanted the Lamb. I'm sure all over our pulpits, all over the world, pastors are preaching, Jesus died to satisfy the anger of God. Jesus died to appease God. What a misnomer. How will God be the one that offered Jesus to die 
and the debt will be to appease God himself. Is he the slave owner? God is perfect in all his ways. In him there is no darkness at all. So again, have you seen the wrath of God in the course of this study? Can you see lots of people in the Old Testament? They had limited knowledge of God. Yet, they wrote many books. I mean, can you imagine how many books Job wrote? 42 chapters. How many did Brother Paul write? 42 chapters. Job alone. You know, only people will still argue after this because the only reason why people will argue after these things I have taught today is because they don't believe in Jesus. They don't believe in Jesus. When Moses was running up, he said, a prophet like unto me shall the Lord your God raise up unto you. Him shall you hear. He says, and any of you that will not hear that prophet shall be destroyed. Anyone that will not hear Jesus shall be destroyed. Hear him only. He offered no animal, but he gave them enough work. I'm talking of Moses. Moses never offered any animal sacrifice. While they were killing animals and offering animals and all that, Moses never offered even one chicken. Number two, Moses never for once, never for once, obeyed the instruction of entering the Holy of Holies. He entered in there anyhow and came out. Thirdly, Aaron never sprinkled blood on Moses. That's why Moses is a servant over his house. Moses knew better. The Bible says Moses already saw Christ. Moses knew the riches of Christ. Glory to God. Moses saw the riches of Christ. He knew that there was nothing required of man to do. That Christ was going to be the sacrifice. He said, you don't believe Jesus. Israel, since you don't believe Jesus, take 612 laws. Since you don't believe Jesus, I gave you Jesus, you rejected Jesus. You are children without faith. Okay. Take 612 laws and even the 12th one is open-ended. And God has always been consistent. So let no man say, when he's tempted, I'm tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted of evil, neither tempted he any man. Now, look at Matthew 27, 46 as a roundup. Are you blessed? Glory to God. Matthew 27, 46. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabathani. That is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Look at Psalm 22 verse 1 because that's where he quoted from. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me and from the words of my roaring? Now please pay attention. Look at me everybody. Psalm 22 started with that but did not end with that. Look at me everybody. Psalm 22 started with that, but did not end with that. The question is, did God abandon Jesus? Did God abandon Jesus? Because that's another assumption. Did God abandon Jesus? God abandons no man, not even the sinner. God abandons no man, not even the sinner. Look at that Psalm 22 so you understand why the impression you will have is that God abandoned Jesus. Psalm 22 where they quoted from the prophecy of his death and burial. Psalm 22 verse 8. Psalm 22 verse 8. He trusted on the Lord that he will deliver him. Let him deliver him. Seeing he delighted in him. That's the prophecy. Verse 20. 22, 20. Psalm. Deliver my soul from the sword. My darling from the power of the dog. Still prophecy concerning the death and burial of Jesus. Verse 22 now. 22. I will declare thy name unto my brethren in the midst of the congregation will I praise thee. So, my God, my God, why has thou forsaken me? Did he end with that phrase? It was many things that Jesus said that started with that statement. 
So Jesus was not abandoned. Because on the cross, that's not all he said. He said many things. God abandons no man. Luke 23, 46. Luke 23, 46. We're looking at God's character. And when Jesus had cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And having said thus, he gave up the ghost. This was the last thing Jesus said. So the father didn't abandon him because if the father abandoned him, he wouldn't have committed his spirit to the father. Things on the cross. So he trusted his soul to the father. He trusted his soul to the father. Look at 1 Peter 2.23. Righteously. Are you still in the building? Look at Acts 2.25. Let's see what Jesus said on that cross. All the things he said. For David speaketh concerning him. I foresaw the Lord always before my face. For he is on my right hand that I should not be moved. 26. Therefore did my heart rejoice. Thou hast made me known. Thou hast made known to me the ways of life. Thou shalt make me full of joy with thy countenance. 29. Me and brethren, men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that is both dead and buried, and his sepulchre is with us unto this day. 30. Therefore, being a prophet, and knowing that God has sworn with an oath to him, that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he will raise up Christ to sit on his throne. 31. Pay attention. He is seeing this before spake of the resurrection of Christ that his soul was not left in hell neither did his flesh see corruption. Jesus told them all he said. I'm talking about Peter and the rest because that's Peter was talking now. So God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. The father offered the son for sin. We were captives of sin. The son now became captive for sin. He gave Jesus to die. And his life now becomes the spirit in us. God has never been angry with anybody. Never. Not an atom. He has never been angry with anybody. He has never punished anybody anybody and he will never punish anybody question does it mean what you are saying that people will not be punished I didn't say so I didn't say so but God never punishes anyone even though man's perception of God changed over time God is still the same consistent God good God good God do not err my beloved brethren <laughs> do not err my beloved brethren every good gift and every perfect gift coming from above it coming from the father of lights with whom there is no variableness neither a shadow of turning of his own will begat he us of his own will begat he us he is always giving and giving and giving he never takes that's my God he is always giving and giving sin demanded death he gave it Sin demanded a man. He became a man. Sin demanded the man to be tested. He gave into temptation. He allowed himself to be tempted. Sin demanded his captives. And he used his captives to kill him. He died. Sin demanded his blood. He gave it. But that is sin's limit. Death. God went beyond death. Arose on the third day. I am the resurrection and the life. If you were dead, when you believe in me, you will rise. You will never see death. Jesus conquered death. He gave death an eternal, an eternal dismissal. He put an end to death by the sacrifice of himself. He is life. And today, he is sealed in our hearts forever. By his spirit. So today and forever. We have life. He that has the son. Has life. 
Romans chapter 5 verse 8, but God commended his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He that spared not his own son, but gave him up for us all. How shall he not always, also with him, freely give us all things? Away with the misconceptions. Away with the bipolar image of God. God never changes. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is altogether lovely, altogether beautiful, altogether good. There is no bad in God. Hallelujah. Father, I pray for everybody under the sound of my voice this morning. Kabayatana. Brenda go, Lodo Bonje Gale, and Amanda Lada Brene Keleda Bada. Bada. Rokoska Bareke Telina. Egemano Kalanimbra Nangro do Zucle de Brenanda Lada Bambro Nekele de Babaya. Metola Base. Metola Base. Say of the Spirit of God, you take hold of these realities. You walk in these realities. You live in these realities as the only realm that is real to you. And you experience the victory of my resurrection non-stop. You experience the triumphant life that is yours. And you begin to see what you call battles and circumstances cheaply dissolve and dismantle right in your very face. You begin to see the reality of my victory over sin, over Satan, and over the circumstances of life. You lay hold on these realities. Walk in the consciousness of these realities. Leave, leave. Leave. You live in a world within this world that is superior to this world. You live in the realm that is above the realm of the earthly and you dominate this world. Everything that the enemy and everything that the orchestrations of men can offer, whatever they are called, you live in this reality and all of them crumble like a pack of cards before your face. And you experience victory over circumstances, over diseases, whether, whether they are orchestrated by man or they came from carelessness or from the devil. You live in these realities and all the diseases that this world can ever manufacture will be of no relevance to you. It is the realm of total triumph and victory. The realm of my resurrection. The realm where death has no reign. The realm where death has no authority. The realm of immortality. The life of God. God, and you live in these realities, and you live a life of joy, a life of peace, a life of comfort. Did I not say in my word that the fruit of righteousness shall be peace, quietness, and assurance forever? That is the realm. You embrace this reality, saith God, and you walk in these realities. You live in these realities. The realities of what I have made out of you as a new creation. You are my workmanship, saith God, created in Christ Jesus. You live in that realm. You walk in that realm. Allow that realm become more real to you than anything else this world offers. And enjoy victory the remaining days of your life. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. If you receive that word, go ahead and celebrate it. Glory, glory, glory. Glory. Mandolo do bambre ne kila na manga. Ilamano mozi gilia nangle. Nembran nanglo do boje kelida babari. Retoba litemba nangle de baura namandele de babri ne hetaya. 
In the midst of uncertainties and in the midst of insecurities and in the midst of a world that is flooded with fear and flooded with uncertainties, governments not sure of what the future holds, you embrace these realities and you enjoy rest, you enjoy peace. And you suddenly know exactly what to do and you are able to see right into the future and know exactly what to do. And you become the person that is able to give direction and give hope and counsel to those that are confused. You keep yourself in my love you stay your heart on me and enjoy perfect peace, saith God. Great days ahead. Great days are ahead for the demonstration of my glory and power by my church. And I am equipping and preparing you, saith God, because exciting days for my people are still ahead. So you rejoice, you celebrate. You rejoice, you celebrate. You rejoice, you celebrate. The best is yet to come, saith God. Hallelujah. 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 <laughs> Thank you, Father. Amen. Oh, hallelujah. Praise God. I'm, I'm so excited this morning, friends. I'm so excited. You know, last night I was studying about 1, 2 a.m. I was studying and praying for all of you last night. And I got a later, an email from one of my daughters, one of our pastors in the Abuja campus. I don't want to call her name. She wrote me an email that delighted my heart at 2 a.m. 1, 2 a.m. I got excited when I saw the email. And she was talking about the misunderstood God. I mean, it's a whole epistle and everything here is just fantastic. Concerning David's assumptions. David's assumptions. In fact, let me read it so that it can bless you also. Going through First Chronicles, going through Chronicles chapter 17, verse 1 to 15, and then First Chronicles 28, 1 to 7, I saw David's presumption. David, instead of having faith in God's ability to build himself a house not made with hands, saw God's wrath. He thought in his mind that God was angry with him. That that was why he did not want him to build God a, God a house. His mindset did not even allow him to listen or hear or understand what Nathan the prophet explained as a reason. God said he could not or should not build a house for him. Nathan clearly told him in 1 Chronicles chapter 17 verse 3 to 12 what God's reasons were. Number one, God has never asked for a house from any of the leaders before him. God has been moving from one tent to the other because God's house is not built with hands. But number four, God's house will be built by God himself. Acts 7, 47 to 49, Acts 17, 24. The only thing God wanted from all the leaders before David and even the David himself was according to 1 Chronicles 17, verse 6, a commandment to feed his people. When God spoke of the everlasting kingdom or throne, David thought God was referring to his earthly kingdom. When God spoke about raising a seed after David, whose kingdom shall be forever, First Chronicles 17, 11, God, David thought God was talking about his natural son as successor. But one will, one will say, how could David think it would be his natural child when he had the word forever? Will any of his natural children live forever? Another presumption. She wrote it in capital letters. However, the one the forever spoke about was Jesus whose death, burial, and resurrection made us God's permanent abode. First Corinthians 3.16 and First Corinthians 6.19. In relating to Israel, why he did not build a house to God in First Chronicles 28.3-7, David changed Nathan's message completely. He told Israel that God forbade him to build for him because he has shed blood, because he was a man of war. First Chronicles 28.3. Moreover, he told them that God has chosen Solomon instead to build him a house. Oh my God, she exclaimed. This is a complete different message from what Nathan told him in Chronicles 17 to 15. In fact, David reported to them that God said he will make Solomon's kingdom last forever. If only Solomon will be constant to do God's commandment. First Chronicles 28, 7. 
Let's look at this critically. Let's think or reason it out. If God forbade David like he claimed because his hand was stained with blood, why would the same God accept Solomon to deal with David's blood money? I mean, think about it. Secondly, was David not fighting for God according to the Old Testament? David was a man of valor for God now. Why will God reject him the honor to build for him, knowing that he shed the blood in the Lord's battle, in the Lord's battle, in quote. This clearly shows that something was wrong somewhere. To think that till today and tomorrow, to think that till today and tomorrow, folks are still building all kinds of buildings for God. And when the houses are completely built, they bring Ororo with lorry to pour on the sound and floor space like the temple of Solomon. They will say that they saw smokes coming out or oozing out from the walls of the building. I <laughs> leave this matter. Thank you, my papa, for eye-opening teachings. <laughs> this, is, this so blessed me. You know why this blessed me? That she was listening to me teach and didn't just stop at what I taught, went through the scriptures for herself and came up with other assumptions and presumptions of God. I mean, that blessed me and I'm excited. That people are learning, people are growing, and people are seeing the realities contained in the scriptures. Hey guys, we love you guys. What a blessing to be with you this morning. Tomorrow morning, I'm here live at 8 a.m. and 11 a.m. still teaching on the misunderstood God. Let me tell you something. I'm not sure I'm going to finish this tomorrow. I'm not sure. But I will let you know what happens after tomorrow. But hey guys, happy Easter, happy celebrations, happy holidays. Make sure you spend time with your family. Take time and go through the scriptures with your wife and children, husband and wife. Take time spend with your children too. Go through the scriptures. There can be no better investment in this time of vacation for anybody than to spend the time training your family, spending time with your children and your husband, pray together, study the word together, go through the scriptures, build up a strong spiritual force in your family so that when this corona stuff is over, your family comes out very strong, ready to face the new world. Ready to face the new world. But hey guys, I'm excited. It's been an honor serving you the grace of God. And it's been an honor fellowshipping with you. I want to also use the opportunity to thank all of you that keep sending in offerings. Almost every day after the service, people just keep sending in offerings and honoring this ministry and supporting this house. So together we continue to spread the vision of reintroducing Jesus to this generation. Equipping the believer to know who you are in Christ, what you have in Christ. And what Christ can do through you. I declare and I declare for every one of you that has sent offerings even last night. That God meets all your needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. And I pray for those that are given even now. Every need of yours is met. And I declare that you continue to be sufficiently supplied for. God is able to make all grace abound towards you. That you always have all sufficiency in all things. You abound unto every good work. I decree that your needs are met supernaturally. Father, we give you praise. In Jesus' precious name. Hey guys, we love you. Looking forward to connect with you again live tomorrow morning, 8 a.m. GMT plus 1 and 11 a.m. GMT plus 1. And don't forget, 12 noon in the next few minutes, we'll go live again with another teaching. And 6 p.m. this evening, we'll go live again with another teaching. And 10 p.m. tonight, we'll go live again with another teaching. It's word, 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 word. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Praise God. Well, share the video. Invite more people to be part of this broadcast that are going on. And until I come again your way live, enjoy the rest of your day and be blessed. Amen. Praise God forevermore. Mm -hmm.